Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. As a reminder, this evening at 6 p.m. Um, Pacific time, Fun Collapse is hosting an in-person event where we're going to have 10 military veterans pitch their company for two minutes and a panel entrepreneurship in Seattle. And that's going to be on my LinkedIn Live. Also, my company, Cavanis HR, is getting released, ready, ready, ready to release our MVP, and we're looking for beta testers to sign up for our wait list. And you can sign up for that at www.cavanishr.co. Our guest today is Madeline Holland. Madeline, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready. Madeline, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I just lost your thing, so let me pull it up. Yeah, no worries. Madeline is, is TBB's co-CEO. She has been working to expand access to skilled migration for, for refugees for the last five years. Madeline joined TBB after spending several years helping refugees and immigrants break into the U.S. labor market and seeing how often people's skills and experiences were overlooked. Madeline has a BA in American history from Harvard University, and she leads TBB's global team alongside Melbourne-based Steph Cousins. Madeline, thank you for being here today. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to talk about so, TBB. So before I start talking about your nonprofit, your organization, talk about your background some. So you, you, how do you get involved in this? Like you have your, 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 your degree in history from Harvard. And like me, I, like I actually love history and my major is supposed to be history. And then I, then I found out how much money they get paid for being a history major, right? And so, okay, <laughs> let me try to do something else, right? So can you talk about your background a little bit and talk to you about you, about you yourself? Yeah, college probably was an important time for me in sending me kind of down this path. Like you said, I studied history and literature in college and I studied American history and literature mostly. And, you know, like most many people who study that topic, I was really interested in sort of the narrative of America. Where did this come from? Who are we? Who do we tell ourselves we are? Uh, how do we fall short of that narrative? In what ways are we deluding ourselves? You know, those were the kinds of questions I was interested in. Um, and how we talk about versus how we treat people seeking a new life, people who don't have other options, um, that struck me as this place of major contradiction. You know, not new, lots of people find that when they dig into it. You know, on the one hand, we're raised on some story of a melting pot, some story of suddenly you're tired, you're weak, you're oppressed, you're huddling masses, yearning to be free. And, you know, that resonates, especially when you come like me from an immigrant family. Uh, and then you sort of read about the history of American immigration, the history of American refugee and asylum policy, and you think, how is it that this storyline persists in the face of so much evidence to the contrary about who we really are when it comes down to it? So that was, that was my interest in college was, um, what are the demands that we put on people who, you know, in theory, we have open arms for? Uh, in practice, what are we doing? What are, what, are we, what are we making them do to belong here? Um, and that was kind of complemented at the time by a lot of, you know, volunteer work that I was doing in the Boston and Cambridge area with helping people locate, you know, appropriate social services. And I found often that the people who struggled the most, who had the least things sort of um, accessible to them were people who were recent immigrants or refugees to the area. So I used to taught English to a group of refugees at, at, at um, in a summer camp and that was really a transformative experience for me and then finally towards the end of college I spent some time with the International Rescue Committee connecting people with their sort of first job in America after they arrived and um, that too just left a major impression on me where I would be supporting people who had just arrived to the United States to you know build their resumes and put their best foot forward in front of American employers and really understanding the ways that that was a challenge, not because people didn't have skills, people were coming from lifetimes of skills, but because people on, on, on this side of the world maybe weren't prepared to recognize that or, you know, found it unfamiliar or had in their mind a set of stereotypes about what people who came as refugees were capable of. So, you know, I would drive people who were database managers to interview as a dishwasher, or I would drive people who had done logistics for the U.S. Army to, you know, be a taxi cab driver and all of those are noble professions but it seemed like a real oversight of 
about how much experience and, and life people come with to this country. So those were some of the motivating experiences that made it such that when I heard about Talent Beyond Boundaries and this idea that you were going to try to acknowledge and um, identify the sort of lives that people lived, including the skills that they had to offer and find ways for people to move to new countries, not just because they're refugees, but uh, because they are ready to be part of new communities and rebuild their lives. For me, the, the, in, the mission was very inspiring. And once I got started, I got hooked and here I am five years later. So that was a bit of a long answer, but that's no, how I- No, 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 that's great. You know, you, you brought a good point. Like we do have like this myth of, the, you know, everyone come to our country, be the best can be. But I mean, there have been so many anti-immigration laws through the, through the years, right? I mean, like even beginning the country, like the anti-Irish law, anti-Italian, the Chinese laws, the yellow law. I mean, over and over again, like there's these quotas we put on, right? And, and, and it's just amazing that we have this myth going on. And then like I was, and, and, and like people, like you said, about people coming here being like dishwashers and taxi cab drivers as being like doctors and stuff. I mean, that's a true story. Like I was in the army and I know several people who are like uh, translators in Afghanistan come back here and they can, they can't get the equivalent job, right? So exactly. question for that is, is it obviously because the system set up to kind of make them feel it's kind of hard, but is that also because I don't know the answer to this. Is that, is that also because the education system is different? Like, you know, like a, Doctor here is a doc is different than doctor would have said in Afghanistan, or is that is that some of it too, or is this all just straight like racist anti discriminatory practices? I think I've, it definitely it's a complex thing. You know, places and professions have good reasons to want to make sure that when they're certifying someone here, it's the same as a certification there. Absolutely. Um, I think the layers and layers of difficulty that we put on people, the cost, the cost, the cost, the complexity, the complexity. I think it's just it's not serving anybody. It's not really serving. Um, there could be other other. Um, there are ways to really recognize the skills that people have and find the right way to make sure that they're contributing to the community. And we just put a lot of barriers in place to make that happen, whether that's language access barriers or cost barriers or like poorly documented processes type barriers. Um, so I don't think by any means it's discrimination alone. I think there are real complexities when it comes to recognizing skills from one part of the world with another. But if you think about what something that we found is that employers actually are quite well equipped to measure you know skills gained over there versus skills gained over here and there's a big movement i think more much more broadly in in hiring in skills recognition to say you know we need to move beyond reliance on qualifications i'm saying the ba means x and ma means x and we need to move to really understanding the skills that people are bringing to the table um, and employers have you know years of experience decades of experience doing that you know designing recruitment processes that really test for what they're looking for. And we found that when um, people get the chance to put themselves forward, to be tested on the basis of their skills and not just on the basis of sort of the headlines of their life, you know, the fact that they got displaced, the fact that they didn't, maybe didn't get to finish their education, when they really get to put themselves forward on the basis of what they're capable of, then a lot is possible. So I would say, you know, qualification recognition is a complicated area and there are so many great groups like World Education Service, et cetera, doing really good work to try to make that more accessible in the US and Canada. But at the same time, we've found that employers really understand that skills and understanding what your candidate can do are at the heart of making a good match. And so that's why our process at Talent Beyond Boundaries is really employer driven. You know, we put employers in the position to identify who works for their company when they are, uh, you know, recruiting our candidates from abroad. I mean, talk about qualifications. I mean, even in the United States, a lot of companies are getting rid of the like, college degrees, right? Like they don't care if you're in a college and I just so you can do the job, right? Exactly, exactly. Because I think that there's a, you know, a recognition that um, it's impossible to know based on some arbitrary sort of stamp of approval, what you're going to be like in the workplace, what you're really going to contribute. Um, so I think there is a growing movement, especially because people who have had maybe untraditional um, educational experiences or, you know, just challenges in life may not have some of those stamps, but it's not necessarily a reflection of what they might bring to the workplace and the community and um, so I think that's a that's a, a movement that we're moving right alongside this idea that employers are well placed to help under, to help to help um, identify people who can do the job, not necessarily who look on paper a particular way. So Madeline, what you're doing is great and all, but how do you make sure these people are who they say they are? 
is like what kind of background check system is the kind of database you go into like how do you make sure these people actually who they say uh, say they are yeah being truthful that's a great i mean it's a it's a totally fair question i think that there is a sort of um my my personal sense just from working in the space is that there's a bit of a stigma around being a refugee as if as if refugees are somehow more dangerous or less truthful or more likely to deceive than others um, and i think that that's a stigma that we need to you know work through and dispel and um i think the more and more people you meet who've been through these situations of being displaced the less and less sort of urgent the need to differentiate them from others by by suggesting that they are less likely to be who they are becomes but that said, we work with people who both have to be sort of recruited by an employer and then um, receive a visa from a government. So everybody that we work with who's moved to Australia, to Canada, to the United Kingdom has gone through the exact same kind of security, background, police, uh, biometrics, checks that anybody coming into those those countries would. So those countries, you know, ultimately we don't have the control over who those countries are going to admit. And it relies on those countries to be sure that they can be confident about the background um, and self-representation of the people that we've submitted or that the employer has nominated. So it's really very comparable to other immigrants or refugees moving into the country where um, governments, you know, invest serious resources in um, identity confirmation uh, and, and security checks before issuing a visa. Yeah, I think it'd be a good point. I, I think this is proven over and over again. Whenever someone says, you know, I don't like blank demographic or these people are, are bad or whatever the case may be, whenever they actually meet these people one on one and get to know them, they change their mind. Absolutely. Because I think, you know, these questions of how do you, how do you know anybody is who they say they are? You, you really don't. You don't know anyone if you think about it. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's a valid question in general. And I think certainly there are unique challenges to people who've been displaced. Maybe they've got lacking documentation. Maybe it's difficult for them to contact, you know, references that they had in their country of origin, or maybe it's difficult for them to produce, you know, their transcripts or CVs. So those are all challenges, but all of those can be worked through. You know, you can talk to, um, many have expired documentation or proof of entry to different countries. Many are registered with the UN Refugee Agency. Many have, um, you know documentation that they brought with them so i think it's a bit um i think there's a there's a a kernel in there that is about sort of the mystery and distrust that we associate with the word refugee of like who are these people really when like you say i think you know they're just they're just people who um can be kind of identified the way many other people can be identified yeah. <laughs> melon can you give us like a basic definition of what is a refugee, what's an immigrant, are they the same thing, are they interchangeable, are they completely different items? I hit on a very um, important area and I should clarify right up top, I am not a refugee or immigration lawyer um, who would be able to give you sort of the very precise legal definitions of these terms in international law, but I think um, broadly speaking, a refugee is somebody who has been forced to flee their country of origin and you know, typically you know legally refugees at least you know for example in the united states or groups that have adopted countries that have adopted um, major agreements on this a refugee is somebody who's fled on the basis of persecution on a protected ground so maybe they belong to a social group or have a political opinion or you know a, a way of life or um a religion that is uh, unacceptable to the community or country that they live in and they have been persecuted and put in danger um, you know they, they have reason to fear for their well-being their life on the basis of that and as a result they've moved to another country to try to seek you know greater safety so that's kind of the definition of a refugee is somebody who's fled to gain greater safety um, and cross an international border in the process. And so the people that we work with at Talpian Boundaries are refugees. These are people in need of international protection, which means that they have fled their countries of origin, whether because of war or you know, specific circumstances that make it impossible for them to stay um, and are living in a country that is not their home um, as a refugee. Uh, an immigrant, is somebody who you know the the sort of again the sort of 
formal definition of it is somebody who's crossed an international border. And it doesn't really specify, you know, it's not a tourist, but somebody who's crossed an international border for the, for the purposes of work, where to live, to stay. I mean, immigrant rather than migrant suggests a sort of permanent move. You know, somebody has immigrated from China to the United States, like in my family's case. Um, I think what we have found is that there is a desire probably because of our out of a desire to understand the world you know to split these into these two very distinct categories immigrants move for work for school for love for um, opportunity refugees move because they have to and they have no other choices and they only get to move as refugees and what we found is that you know again to this point of you know we're all just <laughs> we're all not that dissimilar refugees want to move for work for love for school for opportunity for new lives for stability for better lives for their kids you know and we make it uniquely difficult for them to do so because they happen to have been through an experience of displacement from their country of origin so that's part of what we are working on at talent beyond boundaries is saying Refugees have been through and lived through a unique set of circumstances that have made it impossible for them to go back to their country of origin, which is different than many immigrants who probably can return home. But refugees may well want to be immigrants. Refugees should be able to move for work, for love, for opportunity, whatever it may be, without um, barriers or kind of discrimination just because they're refugees. So just to say they are two different words with two different meanings. And I think there is room to be open to the complexity of the reality that people have. It's it's not black and white, you know, people have lots of reasons and motivations and and complex experiences. And um, there are ways in which thinking more flexibly about the ways that people on the move um, can get to where they're trying to go. There are ways that thinking about that flexibly is valuable. And that's something that we've been doing at Talpy on Boundaries is really trying to um, think, think about this more creatively. You know, how can we use the ways that immigrants move to be, how can we make that accessible to refugees? How do we make sure that refugees can move uh, through, you know, humanitarian routes, through traditional resettlement, that those systems that are designed for people on the basis of their persecution are, are robust and protected and essential, while also saying we can't cut them out of everything that enables immigrants to move. We need to make these accessible also. Um, we need to grow the, the sort of um, opportunity rather than restrict it. So Madeline, next talk about high skilled versus low skilled. And I hate to use the term low skilled because people, when you say low skilled, you know, it's, they think, you know, the trades, like construction, welding, plumbing, but you know, we all know you have to be very highly skilled to be successful at those, right? Mm. So does does so? Do y'all like focus on highly skilled workers, low skilled workers? I, I want to focus on low skilled workers because I know in America there's like a like there's like a, a very a great need for like plumbers, construction people, electricians, right? And I think it'd be like a, a great to me it makes sense being as talented for overseas where you can, right? Yeah. I, I think that you're so right. When you talk about skilled immigration or labor migration, this sort of perception is that you mean people, you know, you mean doctors, you mean lawyers, you mean PhDs, you mean engineers. And certainly we work with people who have those sets of skills and we've had people be incredibly successful as computer engineers and, um, you know, nurses. We also though, of course, work with people who have skills like you mentioned, like welders, like roofers and carpenters, like tool and die makers, like butchers, um, because those skills are really in demand as well. So when we talk about skills at TVB and we talk about skilled migration, we're talking about people who fill an employer's demand, basically. We're restricted a bit by what we're able to, you know, what the immigration system exists to facilitate. And in particular, we're often looking for a route that will allow someone to live there ultimately permanently. So we do have to be um, looking for jobs that will fit those qualifications. But we um, work with people across that range of that, that spectrum. Um, it, to back to that point about employers really knowing what they need, I think you're absolutely right. There's huge demands for people who have very specific backgrounds and experience in things like plumbing, electricians, um, 
you know, across the skilled trades, we've really found that. So we absolutely work. And, you know, there's so many talented people um, living in countries right now where they're not allowed to practice those skills. So we definitely work across that, across that spectrum. Uh, we're really employer led. So what employers are looking for, we seek to, to find. And Talent Beyond Boundaries is a nonprofit or for-profit company? We're a not-for-profit. Absolutely. So, so on your website, you have some like great partnerships, great sponsorships. How have y'all done like get, how y'all have y'all obtained all these great sponsorships, right? You have, you have some great partners on your website. Have you, what's the process for obtaining these partners for for what you're doing? Um, we have partners of so many different kinds. So obviously as a nonprofit, you know, funding partners are essential. People who really believe in this and have the resources to support it, that's, you know, absolutely key to being able to do the work. And that can come in the form of individuals or foundations or governments. Um, but like any nonprofit, we, we uh, rely on sort of donors who see the vision, see the big picture and want to support a vision of the future where people can move on the basis of their skills to rebuild their lives. Um, even if they've been through sort of an experience of being displaced from home. So we have all kinds of other partners. So we have, you know, employer partners. Obviously, employers are essential to this work. And, you know, employer partners, we, we um, sort of build those partnerships through letting the talent speak for itself. We, uh, um, you know, engage with corporates to understand what their hiring needs are and to see if this talent pool that's really been historically overlooked could offer a solution. And we've had amazing luck to be put in touch with just the most um, compassionate and, and sort of forward thinking employers who've been absolutely essential to proving this concept. So we have employer partners, we have civil society partners. I mean, I'm, as you know, there are amazing nonprofits all over the countries that we work with, Jordan, Lebanon, Australia, Canada, UK, who have been doing you know, decades of important work to address a lot of similar barriers to what we're addressing, whether that's helping people who've already arrived as refugees, lock, link into jobs, um, you know, deploying technology in interesting ways to make that more possible. We worked with a group called Refugee Talent in Australia, a group called Jumpstart Refugee Talent in Canada, for example, who are you know, refugee-led organizations who have been doing this work of interesting employers, um, you know, overcoming some of the challenges or stigma associated with refugee workers. Um, so we're, we partner with those groups. We've, we've, uh, we partner with groups like World Education Services, like I mentioned, um, immigration law firms, where we have a partner called Fragman, is one of the leading immigration law firms in, this, in, in the world who's been essential to helping us um, deliver the best advice possible and, and formulate you know, the best recommendations possible. So I guess I would just say this process relies heavily on partners, on settlement service organizations, um, on a group called Miles for Migrants who helps us sometimes book flights when, when candidates can't afford them. So there are so many partners involved in making this work happen, you know, in, in, in moving any one family, um, helping them put their best foot forward to an employer, helping them move from point A to point B and then to settle be, and be successful there. Um, there are so many partners involved and, you know, our, our way we see our role is really as this connector who helps um, sort of put this issue on the agenda and, and, and identify where other people are already doing amazing work that we can, um, that we can tap into for this population who's still living as refugees. Uh, so just to say lots of partners, I'm sure that some of the people listening right now work with organizations that could be um, really fantastic partners for a group like ours. So I would just encourage anybody who's interested to reach out, see how we might collaborate. Uh, but I, know, I know like we were talking about time, like startup founders, like raising money with VCs and angel investors for part of their company equity in the company, so to speak, but basically you're doing the same thing, right? But instead of equity in the company, you, you're selling like the dream, the vision of making the world a better place, right? But you still got to raise funds. You're still the whole same, basically the same process, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the sort of the return is impact, you know, the return is, is um, the way that we get to change the world. So um, the return is, you know, income that that the people we work with get to earn that they were locked out of before. So, but it's, yes, it's very much raising the money. <laughs> so next is a two part question. Part one is, is there a certain ge geographical part of the war you focus on? And if so, like, how do you decide what that is? Right. Cause you know, the stuff going on in Syria, you know, that's a bad case to Ethiopia. And I hope I'm wrong, but I think there's probably a refugee crisis in Afghanistan pretty soon with the stuff going on in Afghanistan. Right. There's always this, 
stuff over on the wall, right? And like, even though you're doing a great job raising funds, you, you only have limited resources, right? How do you decide where to focus on? Yeah. So like I said, on the destination side, uh, well, let me, let me back up. Let's say our, our sort of our vision is to really make a fundamental change to how it's possible for refugees to move. You know, we want this idea that refugees can move on the basis of their skills, but they're not blocked out from moving for work just because they're refugees. We want that to be, you know, so normal that in 10 years, 20 years, if I came on this podcast, everyone would be like, this is such old news. <laughs> like what? This is, she's saying nothing because it's normal. You know, of course, people who've been displaced can move for work. Like, what's the big deal? That's our vision, you know, is a world in which all of this is taken for granted, where the fact that we existed can be forgotten because uh, we achieved what we were looking for. You know, people can move for work um, even after experiences of displacement. And employers look to that as a solution and the services and coordination and all these partners, you know, this process works. So the, the vision is very global, I would just say. So in terms of where we work now, it's kind of you know where we started and what are we learning in these places that we can apply to other parts of the world? What are we learning that we can share with other organizations who are doing frontline incredible work in their communities, whether that is like you say, Ethiopia or Afghanistan or Central and South America. You know, what, what have we learned in our work that we can share with these other organizations who are already working with refugees to rebuild their lives? How can we let them know that this is also an opportunity they could take advantage of? So right now we work in Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and we've been doing a lot of work on policy in those places to make the routes more accessible, to help them understand what is it about the way that you've designed skilled migration that makes it uniquely hard for somebody who's been displaced to apply for secure and move for a job to your country. You know, you want to attract the best and the brightest. You want to attract this, the workers who are going to power your economy, who are going to fill your communities, who are going to be the neighbors and friends that you know Canadians or Australians or or um, British people are looking for, and yet you have created some barriers along the way. So we help governments understand what those barriers are and how we can overcome them. So, so oh, go ahead. no, go, no, you go ahead. Oh, but then on the on sort of where do we work right now? We have an office in Jordan and in Lebanon, and we've been there for about five years working with people. Many have been displaced from Syria. We work with Palestinians, with Iraqis, et cetera, people who find themselves displaced from their home countries and living in Jordan and Lebanon. And we are committed to that region and and you know we started there in part because when we started, you know, scoping this out back in 2014, 2015, um, there was just, you know, those countries, including, you know, Turkey are hosting some of the highest numbers of refugees in the world, the highest per capita sort of um, proportions of refugees in the world. And there are many people who've got skills but are blocked out of working. You know, I think that's something I didn't appreciate until I started this work was that often when you're living as a refugee, it's illegal for you to seek work. You know, it's illegal for you to support your family. It's illegal for you to put to use the skills that you trained for. Um, and so, you know, they just, they were the right countries for us to start in and start trying out this solution and working alongside people and, you know, did a lot of um, collaborating with and, and having conversations with people who were living there, um, displaced from Syria or, or, or where have you, um, who really told us in the early days, like, we need this solution. We absolutely need this solution. Like, please keep going. So. That's, that's where we work now, but all with this vision of, you know, sharing what we learn with other organizations in other parts of the world who can also make this a reality for, for the folks that they work with. Because like you said, then, you know, the need isn't going away. The need for people to um, move to what we call durable solutions, which is, you know, somewhere where they can really regain the full rights and status of belonging somewhere. Um, that need's not going away. So. So our goal is to make all of, all of what we learn and all of these routes that we help to open um, relevant to people much further than our own organizational footprint. So all these laws out there, uh, y'all are going to try to change the each individual nation level, which has to be, had to be hard. I mean, that's almost impossible. Is that like the UN or anything like that? And most recent case, it might be not what you're talking about, but I remember, I can't I have no concept of time now, but uh, maybe a few months ago, the country of Belarus had some kind of protest, whatever, 
Mm-hmm. And then they, and the, and people were trying to leave, but the president like cut off all the flights out of the country and stuff like that. So you basically talk about that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> um, you mean at the, at the sort of Australia, Canada, U.S.? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we've tried to be a bit strategic in where we start and where we focus our resources and energy. And, you know, those countries that I named, Australia, Canada, um, the UK, and we're starting to look at the United States and we're sort of gearing up to start really um, doing this work in the US as well as in the European Union more broadly. And we've picked those in part because those are some of the largest skilled immigration systems in the world. Um, And so if we could... It, and, and many of them are looked to as um, exemplars of, of positive immigration and refugee policy. So if we're able to make um, an impact in those countries, we think that will have a disproportionate um, effect. And, you know, we do also engage at, like you said, the UN level and, you know, have done advocacy in, in creating language and global compact that will set the agenda for the international community in terms of what kinds of policies are we trying to set? How do we globally want to deal with refugees, with people on the move, with migrants? How are we going to be globally coordinated? And we have been advocating at that level for, for many years now to make sure that when those international norms are being set, these ideas that refugees should be able to move for work, that you can't exclude people, et cetera. All of that is sort of baked in there. Um, also with the hope that that will have a disproportionate effect on, on systems around the world. So Madeline, you have some great data and great stats on your website. Where does that come from? Does your own internal team research like different organizations pull the stats together? Do you get it from other resources? Where does that great data come from? Data has really been at the heart of our work since the very beginning. So the founders, I think, knew really early on that um, we couldn't make the case that this should be a solution unless we could really demonstrate that there was a population of refugees with the skills needed to fill international skill gaps. And that would allow us to make the case to companies to take a look. That would allow us to make the case to governments to think about policies. And so that was really where we started. And we started uh, building what we call the talent catalog. And today that talent catalog, which is an online platform that collects you know, information about people's skills, it essentially collects CV information, allows people to share information about their language abilities, their past experience, their education, um, you know, specific things that they did and learned along the way. Uh, that now has 30,000 profiles in it of people who are ready to go, ready to work. Um, and the reason that we had to make that and collect that data was because it was very uncommon to collect that information about refugees. Uh, and you know, this comes back to your question about what's a refugee versus what's an immigrant. Um, typically, information that was collected by major major agencies about refugees had a lot more to do with what's wrong. You know, what's 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 not working right now? In what ways are you vulnerable? What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Um, and all of that is really important information, especially when, when you know, accessing those routes we talked about that are humanitarian on the basis of status, resettlement, really important routes to be protected and to be robust. But there was sort of an overlooking of the fact that people also have a lot more than the worst thing that ever happened to them. You know, so the data that we collected had to be what's relevant to employers. It's that really nitty gritty data about what, what can you do as we were talking about, you know, not even necessarily what are your qualifications, but like, well, what can you do? What can you do for my company? How can you, how can you make this all work better? Um, and, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a candidate. We were going through a car intake process where I was asking him a lot about his work experience, et cetera. And he, he, um, he said to me, you know, even the fact that you're asking me this makes me feel like a human being. Nobody's asked me about what I can do in three years. And I think that's just a reality is that the systems set up to serve refugees in the face of, in, in the face of crisis often are so focused on what is wrong and with good reason, obviously, but that they overlook sort of everything else that somebody is. And so, that data um, is an attempt to capture some of that 
some of that, what else, some of the other things that people are as well. Um, some of the other ways that they um, have so much to contribute if, you know, given the chance. Madeline, do you happen to know like how many refugees there are right now and what percentage of the worst population that is? I think at the latest calculation, there's about 26 million refugees. I'd have to check with just the latest numbers came out recently. Um, it's about, you know, the population of Australia. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a large one. amount. Yeah. <laughs> so Madeline, let's talk about um, how um, you run your nonprofit, right? Kind of you and I believe her name is Steph Austin or co-CEOs. Steph Cousins, yeah. Steph Cousins. And every business book you're like, you can't have two co-founders of 50%. You can't have two presidents, you can't have you no know, two of the same. How are you and Steph making this work being co-CEOs when everyone will tell you it doesn't work or should not work? <laughs> That's a good question. I should say from the very start of our organization, we've been this kind of Two, in the sense that, you know, we actually started kind of from two independent origins, a case of kind of convergent evolution where a family, Mary Louise and Bruce Cohen in the United States really had this recognition that this solution was needed. And like I said, they thought we need to start with collecting the data. We need to start in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, we need to start with proving that the supply is there so that we can get governments and companies on board. At the same time, um, really sort of simultaneously, a tech entrepreneur in Australia, John Cameron, was having the same idea, like, this is a good idea. You know, there are companies in this part of the world that want to hire talent. There are people in that part of the world who don't have options that aren't allowed to work. Somebody's got to be making this connection. And he really started building the business support and the government support. Uh, and at some point, we merged. So for the very start, you know, we have the sort of good luck, I think, to be working on in this feeling you get that you're working on an idea that's time has come. You know, that when it's cropping up in different parts of the world, you know, like it's it's time. So we, from the very start, we're merging um, sort of powerful people from across the world. But I think how does Steph and I make it work? Um, we get along really well. I'm the luckiest, you know, co-CEO to be working with Steph. Steph comes with so many years of experience and um, we, we sort of hand the baton off at the 24 hour around the world um, mark, just because she's based in Australia, I'm based in the United States. It allows us to check in at the start and end of days and make sure that we are sort of on 24 seven to, um, help support this very global organization. So I would say don't knock it till you try it. I think there's a lot of um, value to a co-CEO setup where um, you get more diversity of perspective, you get more sort of a collaborative culture, I think that goes throughout the organization. Um, so I would say, give it another look. I think it's having its moment, you know, Salesforce is doing it, lots of different groups yeah. are starting to try it. I think it's, um, I think it's a, a powerful setup. So, <laughs> so Madeline, can you talk some about being a remote remote worldwide organization and how's that's been working for you? Like maybe get some tricks and tools you use. And I gotta go off camera fast, but keep on talking. Sure. Um, you know, we were already pretty remote before pandemic, and obviously the pandemic has turned almost everybody remote for at least a time. Um, I would say, you know, we rely on tools like Slack to keep in touch across time zones and keep a record of our interactions with each other. I think once the pandemic started, we actually started video chatting a lot more, which is helpful. Um, I think that it requires sort of intentionally talking about what, if, what the challenges of it are, because I think it's easy when you don't get to know the people as well to really make time to try to, to try to connect, to try to um, understand each other and where you're coming from because I think it's much easier in a remote organization to um, to grow apart maybe so I think but I, I would say it's something we're still you know asking the team about trying to figure out how do we how do we balance you know not wanting people to be online all the time which is a definite you know temptation in the age of remote organizations with wanting to build a team culture where people feel a part of something so we had a bit of practice because we've always been international and i think it's part of actually probably what people love about it um you know we have colleagues from so many parts of the world and it's such an interesting way to learn about life elsewhere and um sort of grow your perspective so I would say, you know, it's got its pros and cons. You can't wait for the opportunity to, to meet back up in person. 
And like, I know some people will say like negative by remote work is like, you know, you can't build a culture. But I have a thing with the organization like yours, the culture is already built in, right? Everyone has to already be like the all into the culture, right? So I don't think that would be a problem, would it? No, I think that definitely remote organizations have a culture. <laughs> I would definitely say so. And I think, um, yeah, we're, we're lucky that we had some opportunities to meet each other well before COVID started. But um, uh, definitely, I think there's a culture. And for us, a lot of that culture is rooted in um, sort of just deep passion about making this solution work for people. Um, sort of great love of the people that we get to work with and, and gratitude to be part of part of trying to make something work for them. So I think that, you know, we're lucky that we're such a mission driven group because it, it's a unifying part of our culture, I think. So Madeline, as far as like bringing people on to work with you and we hire people, do you find it easier or harder to bring people on? Cause it's the one hiring that's like be easier. Cause like, if they're going to apply for the job, you're going to presume they're passionate about it. You know, they're like, they care about it. But then on the other hand, you know, it might be hard because you're a nonprofit and not be able to pay as much as other people do. You know, so what's, how do you work through that? Yeah, well, I got to be honest, I've never worked in the for-profit space, so I don't have a lot of data to compare it to. Um, but no, I find, you know, we're, we always meet just like outstanding candidates when we have the opportunity to recruit. There are so many people who are passionate about this issue, whether because they have personal or family experience of somebody, you know, who would have benefited from this or because they saw from the employer side and saw, yeah, it's ridiculous how hard we make it for people to come work or because they just, you know, are really moved by the stories of kind of unnecessary thwarting of human potential that there are just people all around the world who are excited about this so no i wouldn't say we have trouble with that if anything we wish we could recruit you know a whole movement of people um behind this idea i know one thing i want your website and y'all actually have some jobs on now i think program manager or something like that and I got to give kudos to whoever does your job because like, I'm not qualified at all. I wanted to apply for the job, right? They're like, man, this is like a great organization. I want to come do this, right? So uh, kudos to whoever's doing your job description. They're, they're doing a great job. Uh, like, thanks. I, like, I want to apply for this. I'm not even qualified. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool group to work for. <laughs> Thank you. So, Manly, next, you talk about the sun, but can you talk more detail, like how Talent Beyond Binaries got started, like its founder story? What you focus on now and what's the vision for that organization moving forward? I mentioned briefly the founder story, but just to go into a bit more detail, like I said, Mary Louise and Bruce Cohen had had long careers in sort of Washington, D.C. Mary Louise is a really prominent lawyer who defended whistleblowers. Um, Bruce Cohen had worked in, as, a, as a chief counsel in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and they sort of got to the to this to a place in their careers where they thought, okay, what else can we do to really make an impact in the world? And they um, attended a program at Harvard that was designed to help people sort of adjusting into a new phase of their careers, figure out what a good social impact project might be. And it was during that time that they, they went to a fundraiser actually for UNICEF and they heard the speaker talk about how she'd just come back from Jordan and had met so many people who'd been, she, she talked about a lawyer she'd met who'd said, you know, I did kind of said like, I did everything right. I followed the track. I, and I was providing great for my kids. You know, my kids had a life like your kids had. And now like, look at me now, look at me now. I can't work. I can't provide. And I think it um, really hit home for the founders, this idea that that could have been us. You know, I think that could be us any moment, you know, for reasons outside our control, everything we worked for could be, taken away and and what would be the solutions available to us. So it was that, you know, they heard that and they thought, okay, there are skilled people sitting around unable to put those skills to use. You know, we know from other work that we've done that skill gaps around the world are a huge issue. You know, companies and, and countries are clamoring for talent that they can't find, they can't source fast enough. I mean, we're seeing that in the United States right now. Um, and I thought, surely somebody out there is connecting the dots. You know, they're connecting the dots between this population of people who wants to work and can't, and this population of companies who wants workers and can't find them. Duh, somebody's out there 
brokering that connection. And sort of the more they looked into it and the more they researched and the more people they talked to, the clearer it became that certainly that idea had been talked about and there was a sort of theoretical understanding that that could be an option worth pursuing, but nobody had tried it. And they thought, oh gosh, I guess that's us. <laughs> so they jumped in and they started trying it and that's really where Telecom Boundary started. And then, like I said, simultaneously, um, John Cameron, a tech entrepreneur who sold his company in Australia and, and ran a, a foundation there had sort of met a, an activist from Syria who had been able to arrive in, in Australia. And he had this light bulb moment of, I used to be an employer and I know that you can bring people into Australia on work visas. Um, and evidently there are people with powerful skills and, and uh, so much to contribute who are living right now as refugees. Um, why couldn't I hire one? You know, why couldn't I, I hire somebody who's a refugee and have that be a way to, to bring them out of displacement? And so, like I said, he started building a real coalition of corporate support and government support. And, and then the two organizations married. And here we are, a very global organization a few years later. So, Madeline, the founders, are they still involved in day-to-day -day business? Like, you have to like, give them updates once a month or something like that? How does that work? How do they still stay involved? They're pretty involved. I mean, we're really lucky to have them have so much skill, basically very relevant skills to this project to have to offer. So John Cameron is also our CTO and he's in there in our tech, you know, configuring that database, um, making it better, making it ready for us to keep growing. And the Cohen's are sort of policy um, whizzes and they're absolutely essential to our, our growth strategy and also to thinking about how we how we make this work in the United States. So yeah, they're still very much involved. Hey, what's the time difference between here, uh, 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 the East Coast and Australia? Uh, I don't like, even like know. like twenty nine hours or something crazy <laughs> like that. It's maybe like fourteen or sixteen, whatever it is. It's not good. I don't know what it is exactly because every every time it's a struggle to think what time is that for you. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. <laughs> So what do you see as the, the future of uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries? Like, is, is, the, is the, the vision and, you know, success metric, like, to decrease refugee population, like 26 million, like 14 million, like, what's the like, increased job? Like, what's, what's the big vision for y'all? Yeah, so the first phase of our work, really, really up until maybe last year, was really on this proof of concept. Can this happen? When we started, we faced so much skepticism, so much skepticism that there were skills, you know, that refugees had skills, so much skepticism that companies would care, so much skepticism that businesses, I mean, that uh, governments would see the value in, in making policy alterations. So we've really gotten to a place now where we've kind of addressed that skepticism. We've shown that it works. You know, we've got now hundreds of people who are living different lives than they were before. Um, so we are now really gearing up for this next phase, which is, like I mentioned, kind of growth and partnership. And so growth as in, you know, okay, you can do this for dozens of people. Now we're ready to demonstrate that, you know, hundreds, thousands of people can move this way if we put the systems in place. So we as Talpian Boundaries are poising to, you know, grow, but to a point. It's not our goal to become a massive organization that spans the whole world and just continually grows. You know, there are lots of organizations like that doing fantastic work and we don't need to become one. Our goal really is to get only big enough as is needed to really prove the concept, to really prove that there is immense value in making this a standard service offering, you know, making this part and parcel of what we think about when we think about how do we connect people to durable solutions. Um, make this normal for companies when they think about how do I recruit the skills that I need. So this next phase is really about working with partners, trying to understand what it would take for them to really get programs like this off the ground. Um, how is it different in their context? And, you know, we, based on our sort of calculations, we think that over the next, if, if we're able to take these three prongs, which is grow ourselves to a point just so much that we have sort of the necessary technical expertise to support this growing movement. And we empower partners to really start doing this work in the ways that make most sense to them. And simultaneously, we continue that work that we've been doing to unlock those barriers that keep people from moving through immigration pathways. You know, if we keep doing those three things, we think we could see millions of people moving over the next several decades. So it's a long-term vision, but the, the big, you know, the big 
vision is like refugees should have equitable access to move on the basis of their skills. So once that's possible, you know, millions of people will be able to benefit from that. Uh, so it's by, day by day, you know, <laughs> one person at a time, one job at a time, one partner at a time, uh, one country at a time. But, you know, just for me, having been here now for, for five years, the, the change is dramatic. You know, when I first started, it was like, this is crazy. And now it's like, well, yeah, this, this needs, you know, needs more time, but this isn't crazy. This makes a whole lot of sense. So I'm optimistic about the future. Man, and when did Talent Beyond Boundaries start? Mary Louise and Bruce really started sort of thinking about this idea back in 2014. Hired so, pr so pretty new. It's, it's quite new. Yeah. Quite new. So Marilyn, do I talk, talk, you've been talking about uh, refugee routes. Can you give us like a quick lesson of what, re what the refugee routes are across the world? Are they, are they the same all the time? Do they change depending on different variables or is a refugee route? Ever, like the refugee route is from Syria to Europe the same all the time? Definitely not, you know, definitely not. The routes, you know, there are an infinity of of different ways that people move. I think when I'm talking about refugee routes, what I what I mean specifically is sort of there are some immigration migration pathways around the world designed for the express purpose of helping refugees relocate from country A to country B. So an example of that is resettlement in the United States. You know, the refugee resettlement program, and obviously, you know. Prior to 2016, the United States welcomed the world's largest number of refugees. Um, and so that would, you know, people would apply across the world or be referred by agencies, and then they would come into the United States under the official status of refugee, and there were about 100,000 a year. And then under Trump, that number got, you know, absolutely slashed to about 15,000 a year. So the number of people being able to benefit from that was just totally decimated. And under Biden, that number is back up at 65,000. So. There, there are these routes for, that's just the United States as an example, but traditional refugee resettlement is what that's called. And that's really facilitated by the UN Refugee Agency and, and agreements with the, the, the receiving government. And um, that is an absolutely sort of critical piece of the refugee protection system because it acknowledges that we need to create routes for refugees who have high you know, vulnerability, serious protection needs, whether that's, you know, a serious medical case or their day, their life is in danger. You know, we need to create ways for those people to move. Um, and it doesn't matter if they have skills. That's not what we're, you know, this is sort of back to what I was saying about send me your, you know, mastering be free. There's gotta be routes that don't matter at all what somebody's work history is. You know, it's on the basis of the fact that they, they are being persecuted and need a route to safety. So that's traditional refugee resettlement. But traditional refugee resettlement, which happens in countries like Canada, the US, um, Australia, you know, it creates a solution for like less than 1% of refugees around the world who need it. And that's why you're seeing this big movement um, that we are a part of to say, okay, that is fantastic and necessary and we should grow it. We should continue to grow it. And we need to be doing more. We need to be doing more because um, it's not enough, basically. So traditional, you know, traditional refugee resettlement, private sponsorship is a growing way that you know it, Canada has a very impressive program that they've started to share with other parts of the world. So there are routes that are more traditionally available to refugees, but you're seeing now a movement in what's called complementary pathways, which is saying beyond those, how else can people move? Can they move for work? Can they move for school? Can they move on the basis of other qualities? Um, because we need more options for people to rebuild. So, man, 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 this might be a, this is a totally random question. What, what you always hear about the refugees in Syria, you know, at other places, Africa, you know, you hear about, you know, all the immigration from, you know, Mexico, Central America, but is there like anything going on in South America, like refugee problems or immigration problems or challenges in South America? Cause I never hear about that on the news, anything going on in South America. Absolutely. I mean, you know, everywhere in the world, there's conflict. There are people who are um, unfairly. So we just don't hear about them on the news then about South America. Yeah, I mean, one, one population you might hear about in the news is people who've been displaced from Venezuela. Oh yeah, living, okay, you're right, yeah, you're right, yeah. Living in countries like Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, um, facing, you know, similar challenges of real challenges accessing the labor market, a lot of uncertainty about when they'll be able to go home, a lot of uncertainty about how long until they've got sort of the normal, you know, those rights that everybody takes for granted, just like the ability to, 
just exist without fear. Um, yeah, so so definitely there's very few regions of the world free of those problems, including the United States. Yeah. Yeah, we forget about that, right? United States has the same problems. Yeah. Um, Madeline, is there anything that I said I asked you that it didn't or anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover? I know. I just, you know, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this. And um, like I mentioned, I think, you know, maybe of interest to this, to this um, audience is we're starting really to think about how do we take what we've learned in other countries and, and start, you know, seizing kind of a historic opportunity to make this solution a possibility in the United States. Um, we are always looking for partners who are interested in this idea who think kind of hear about this and think, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. I can't believe that's not happening yet. How do I get involved? So I just say, you know, if that's you and you're listening, please reach out. Um, and we'd love to, to get you involved. So Melon, speaking of reaching out, can you share your social media links for yourself and your organization so people can reach out to you? Yeah, so you can follow TBB on LinkedIn at Talent Beyond Boundaries or on Twitter at TBB for F-O-R talent, TBB for talent. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at Madeline Holland, but I unfortunately don't have a Twitter to share. No worries. And to the listeners who have the, her social media links and everything else on the show notes, you find the show notes at www.cabinetshallblog.com. And don't, and don't forget to check out Bunker Labs event on, on my LinkedIn Live tonight at 6 p.m. And be sure to sign up for the waitlist for our beta testing for the Cabinet HR MVP at www.cabinetshr.co. So, man, at first, um, I want to I wanna thank you for being here. Also, I want to give you congrats on, like, it seemed like you, you found your life's passion, your life's work, right? And most people never find that right. So you found that, you know, and it seemed like a pretty early age, right? So I want to give you congrats on that, find your life's passion at such an early age and like know what you want to do with your life. And, but like I said, most people have no idea what they would do and never do what they want to do. So that's, you know, that's great for you. Thanks. I mean, what, what I, you know, my, my, what I enjoy really out of this job is letting other people live theirs. You know, I meet sometimes a candidate once said to me, you know, I, I just really want to be able to work because my work is like my fingerprint on this earth. And I thought, I need wow. to like that fingerprint. You that's, know? That, that's a great quote right there. Yeah. I guess I'll use that. So Madeline, um, this has been a great talk. Do you have any like last minute wisdom or advice or anything else you want to talk about? Last minute wisdom. You've really put me on the spot. <laughs> I guess, um, you know, I guess one of the big lessons from this job for me and from, from working on this organization is, um, is not to take no the first time, you know, I'm, you know, and that's, I totally credit the founders with having persisted when things seemed really unlikely and look at where we are now. So I, I think, um, just reflecting with you talking about this, about the journey, I would say one of the big lessons is just, you, you actually can dream bigger than the, the, the people around you think is gonna be possible. And there's, there's, it's cliche, but you know, persistence really is not underrated. Madeline, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.